Few things about the Bible are more commonly known and more controversial than the Ten Commandments. For years, the Ten Commandments were taught in our schools. They were lauded as the foundation for our own laws here in America. They adorned the walls of schools and courtrooms. When I was young, I remember playing a board game that was based on the Ten Commandments. In fact, there were little cards that had one of the commandments, and and part of the game was to collect all ten. I found that game about a couple years ago on eBay. I got it just for old time's sake. Might even bring it Friday to our game night. Everybody, it seemed, knew the Ten Commandments. I mean, maybe they couldn't recite them all by heart, but they knew what they were. They knew how important they were, but how times have changed. Today, the Ten Commandments have been removed from our schools, our courtrooms, and our legislative buildings. The so-called experts deny that America's laws had any connection at all with what we know as the Ten Commandments. Uh, these days, about the only thing people know of the Ten Commandments is the classic Cecil B. DeMille film with Charlton Heston playing Moses, right? It's about the only thing people know anymore about the Ten Commandments. I think, though, what's most surprising is the attitude of many Christians toward the Ten Commandments. You'll hear things like, the Ten Commandments are no longer relevant today. The Ten Commandments are only for the Jews. The Ten Commandments are an archaic legal code that we have outgrown and surpassed. Another writer records this tendency to believe that the Ten Commandments were a masterful document in its era, a concise, direct, and sensible code of ethics for a much more primitive people. However, they say, the Ten Commandments are no longer adequate since we have come of age. In a real sense, we have outgrown them. Some take a more theological approach. Charles Ryrie of the Ryrie Study Bible contends that the Ten Commandments have been done away with. One internet site states, the Ten Commandments are abolished today. And yet, the late Billy Graham wrote that the Ten Commandments will always be relevant. Who do we believe? Well, I am one that agrees we need to rescue, repeat, and reemphasize the Ten Commandments. I do believe, therefore, today. As D.L. Moody put it, the commandments of God given to Moses in the Mount at Horeb are as binding today as ever they have been since the time they were proclaimed in the hearing of the people. The Jews said the law was not given in Palestine, which belonged to Israel, but in the wilderness. Why? Because the law is for all nations. Even the Jews recognized that it was not only for them. This is something God was setting out for the human race, that all people should live by them. So what I would like to do over the next several weeks is take a look at the Ten Commandments for the 21st century. Now, before we get into the individual commands, and we will cover the first one this week, there's two foundational principles that apply to the whole study. And I'd like to just take some time and and look at these. The first is the permanence of this list. The Ten Commandments are not obsolete. They are absolute. They were not made for any particular period of history. They were made for human nature and therefore were commandments for all nations, all centuries, and all cultures. They are as universal and perpetual as honor and truth. No nation can survive apart from a moral base built on them. As Old Testament scholar Walter Kaiser puts it, in Exodus 20, there is an absolute standard for a relativistic age. And that's what we live in. 
We live in a society that's telling us everything is relative. Everything is subjective. You can make it up as you go along. The Bible says, no, this is true for all times. And this is a standard which God himself is establishing. A lot of times we talk about the law of Moses. Uh, It wasn't Moses' law. (laughs) Moses didn't come up with these ideas. The only thing Moses had to do with it was he wrote it down and told it to the people. But in fact, this is God's law. This is God's word. And as God's word, it is timeless. And it does have something to say for every generation, including our own. You may be surprised to know that the phrase Ten Commandments actually appears in the Bible. In Exodus 20, 34, 28, we read, And he, being God, wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Moses repeats this in Deuteronomy 4.13. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow and then wrote them on two stone tablets. Again in Deuteronomy 10.4, the Lord wrote on these tablets what he had written before, the Ten Commandments he had proclaimed to you on the mountain, out of the fire on the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave them to me. Once again, Moses is reminding the people, these aren't my ideas, this is God's. In fact, the Ten Commandments, you could say, are the only things actually written by God because he inscribed them on the two stone tablets. Unfortunately, uh, Moses got mad and broke them, so we don't, they didn't survive, but, but God literally carved them in stone. This is his idea. Occasionally, you will hear the Ten Commandments referred to as the Decalogue. It's just a fancy term that means ten words. Uh, But it, it does show that these were always seen as ten commands. And different churches and interpreters have have kind of rearranged some of how we understand them. But there's always been ten. And if you notice in in Exodus 20, where we're going to begin every one of these studies, Exodus 20 begins with the words, God spoke all these words. Again, we cannot emphasize enough, these are God's words. These are God's ideas. And hence, they do not expire. (laughs) There's no expiration date on God's word. Now, that term word that's used there in Exodus 20 was a a technical term that was used in that time uh, that meant covenant stipulations. A covenant's kind of like a contract between two parties. God often speaks of his... uh, relationship with Israel in terms of a covenant that was made. And these words are are kind of the, the stipulations of that covenant. It has to do with their relationship with God, but we're going to get into that a little bit later, what that relationship is. It's really difficult to exaggerate the importance of the Ten Commandments. For Old Testament ethics, but really for understanding God and what he expects of us. It's at once the very heart and kernel of a very complex system that if you continue through the books of Moses, uh, the the book of Exodus into Leviticus and Numbers, it really expands upon what's written right here. The Ten Commandments are extraordinarily important. Ah, but somebody might say, I thought Jesus did away with the law. I mean, we're, we're under grace, not the law, right? Well, what did Jesus say about that? In Matthew 5, 17, he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. Right there should answer it. He goes on. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
pretty clear, isn't it? Jesus says, I've not come to abolish the law. And the law is still in effect in some degree for all time. Later we see the relationship between the Ten Commandments and Jesus' teaching. In Matthew 22, a lawyer, an expert in the law, asked him a question to test him. He says, teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? Now understand, they were 613 commandments in the law. Uh, it's kind of like this morning when I was standing in my closet trying to decide what tie to wear. There's no real special occasion. I've got all these choices. Oh, you know, what do you pick? You just kind of close your eyes and grab one. He was trying to trick Jesus, but what did Jesus say? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now you say, wait a minute. I don't remember reading any of those two in the Ten Commandments. You're right. But the Ten Commandments are based on those two. As you're going to see, the first four of the Ten Commandments have to do with our relationship with God. Loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The last six have to do with loving your neighbor as yourself. So even the Ten Commandments are based on these eternal truths, these eternal expectations that God has. And we are going to come back to this concept, in fact, this very passage later on as we wrap up our series. But certainly you see the permanence of this list of commands. They will last as long as heaven and earth does. Now, the second foundational principle is the purpose of the law. And this is an often misunderstood concept because of a very popular way of interpreting the Bible that contrasts ages of law and grace. C.I. Schofield is the author of the Schofield Study Bible. He wrote in a book he entitled, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth, in 2 Timothy 2.15... Timothy is told what is required of him as a workman. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Schofield goes on to say, The word of truth then has right divisions, and it must be evident that as one cannot be a workman that needeth not to be ashamed without observing them, so any study of that word which ignores these divisions must in large measure be profitless and confusing. He's saying here that we need to divide the Bible up based on that verse. Now let me just tell you right now, that's not a very good translation of that verse in the original language. It doesn't say anything about chopping the Bible into sections. In fact, the best way to understand that in the original Greek is correctly handling the word of truth. But they take this uh, particular translation and, and enforce it on the Bible into periods of time they call dispensations. Schofield describes them this way. The scriptures divide time, which has meant the entire period from creation to the new heaven and new earth, into seven unequal period, usually called dispensations, all these, although these periods are also called ages and days, etc. These periods are marked off in Scripture by some change in God's method of dealing with mankind or a portion of mankind in respect to two questions of sin and of man's responsibility. Each of these dispensations may be regarded as a new test of natural man and each ends in judgment marking his utter failure in every dispensation. Five of these dispensations have been fulfilled. We're living in the sixth, probably toward its close, and have before us the seventh dispensation. Some will even say there's eight. Uh, they divide another one, uh, but whatever. Really only two are emphasized. And you've probably heard of these. The age of law and the age of grace, right? You heard those phrases before? 
The age of law is basically from Moses until Christ's death and resurrection, and the age of grace begins from there and moves forward. Schofield says, The sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ introduced the dispensation of pure grace, which means undeserved favor and God giving righteousness, instead of God requiring righteousness as under law. Now what this means is, under the age of law, people were saved by keeping the law. Do this and you shall live. But now under grace, all we have to do is believe by faith and God graciously saves us. There is a technical theological term for this teaching. It's called hogwash. It is simply not true. There has always been one means of salvation. And that is by God's grace through faith. At no time has anybody ever been saved by keeping the law. Ever. Paul is very clear on this. Romans 3.20 Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. He goes on in Galatians 2, 15 and 16. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Catch this. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. It cannot happen. It never has, and it never will. Well, yeah, yeah, you might say, but Paul was writing in the age of grace, right? <laughs> I mean, he's, he's talking about the way things are now. And yet, Paul does it twice in the books of Roman and Galatians, we just saw, and the author of Hebrews does it as well, quotes an Old Testament statement. comes from the minor prophet Habakkuk, which says, the just or the righteous shall live, how? By faith. That was an Old Testament idea. Take a look at the book of Hebrews chapter 11. We know it as the great hall of fame of faith, right? All of these Old Testament saints who performed mighty things for God. What does every little biography in Hebrews 11 start with? Two words. By faith, not by works, not by keeping the Ten Commandments, not by impressing God with how good they were, by faith. Why? Because people of all times have only been saved by the grace of God through faith in Him. Now thankfully, recent dispensationalists tried to clear up the confusion. Warren Wiersbe writes, The law was never given as a way of salvation for either Jews or Gentiles. Salvation is not a reward for good works, but the gift of God through faith in Christ. He goes on to say, The law is a mirror that reveals when you're dirty. You don't wash your face with a mirror. You just see that's where the problem is. Only the blood of Jesus can cleanse us from sin. And he's right. We need to get back to that. We need to have a correct understanding of the purpose of the law. Why was it given? And I really like how the NIV Study Bible puts it. The law was given as a way of life for the redeemed, not a way of salvation for the lost. Remember that. The law was never given... As a standard by which God said, if you can live up to this standard, you're in. That was never the case. It was always given as a way of life for someone already redeemed. And you catch this at the very beginning of Exodus 20. Most people, when they recite or study the Ten Commandments, they jump to verse 3 because that's the first commandment. That's a mistake. Take a look at verses 1 and 2. Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. 
he begins with what we would call a redundancy. <laughs> I am the Lord. Now what is the Lord? Yahweh. What does Yahweh mean? I am. What does he say here? I am the I am. But that's who God is. That's God's own name that he has revealed and it speaks of his eternal nature. God is always present. There is no past or future with God because he's above time. I am the Lord your God. And then notice what he did. Who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. See, God had redeemed his people from Egypt. How? By the blood of the Passover lamb. And led them out. They were redeemed. What this means is that grace was already present before the law was given. It's wrong to say that law precedes grace. Grace precedes the law. It was the God of salvation that brought this law to his people. The grace that saves precedes the law that demands. And if we miss this point, we're going to miss the whole meaning of the Ten Commandments. This is not our way of trying to impress God. This is God's way of saying, you're my people, you're my children, now this is how I want you to behave. The relationship's already been established. The people were not given the law in order to be redeemed. They were given it because they always already were redeemed. The law of God is the way of life that is set before those whom he has already saved. And they engage in that way of life as a response of love and gratitude for what he has done for them. See, law and grace are not against each other. They belong together. Grace leads to law. Saving love leads to obedience. And it's only because God was their father and they were his children that he now comes and says, this is how I want you to live. When you have a child, the only ones who have the right to tell that child how to act is their parents. I can't go to somebody else's child and say, you better be home by 9 o'clock. I have no right to say that. Why? Because they're not my children. But I can say to my children, you better be home by 9 o'clock. And they say, why? I say, because I said so. Which just proves I'm their parent, right? God had already established the relationship. Then he brings in what he expects from their behavior. The order is very important. Remember, redemption happens first. Then God says, this is how I want you to live. That is the purpose of the law. Now you get into other passages of the New Testament and Paul does talk about through the law we become conscious of sin and that's true. The law does have a purpose for those outside of God's community because it shows that they have fallen short. But the reason why God gave the Ten Commandments to begin with is because he was telling his people that he had redeemed how he wanted them to live. And I believe it applies to us the same way. God has given us his word to show us how he wants us to live. Not that we earn our salvation, but we live out our salvation. The Apostle Paul would be the first one to say, you cannot work for salvation. But he also said in Philippians, work out your salvation. Once you are saved, once you are a child of God, out of gratitude and love to him, don't you want to live a life that pleases him? Well, how do you know what that is? He tells you. And he tells us in his laws, his commands. 
The very giving of the law was an act of grace. It's a revelation of God's character. And he's saying, if you're going to be my children, I want you to resemble me. And this is the way I am, so this is the way I expect you to act. The Ten Commandments are not obsolete. They are absolute. And in that sense, they are very much appropriate for us to consider, to study, to see how the Ten Commandments fit in the 21st century. Now, with that in mind, it's our task to discover how that commandment was understood in its original context. That's actually how you understand any scripture. Before you can understand what it means today, you've got to understand what it meant then. So with each of the commandments, we'll go back and look. What did it mean at that time? Once we have an understanding, how does that principle apply to our lives today? And it's not always the same because time has changed and we are in a different culture. But the principle of each commandment is still very relevant for today. And with that in mind, I'd like to go into the first commandment. Um, I know there's been a lot of introduction, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on this commandment, but we're going to also incorporate a little bit into the second commandment because they're related. So we'll go into a little bit of this next week as well. But I want to conclude this morning with the priority of the Lord. The first commandment you find in Exodus 20, verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. God is saying, I must have priority in your life. I am to be number one. The Hebrew word here translated before, it says you shall have no other gods before me. It literally means in hostility toward. <laughs> uh, you could get the idea of in my face. Don't have any other gods in my face is what the Lord is saying. I expect to have the top spot in your life. Now to forbid the worship of other gods beside or before the Lord doesn't mean that there are other gods that he competes with. Isaiah 45, 6 says, I am the Lord, there is no other. So don't think that, that our God is just one of many gods and we hope he wins in the end. There is no other God, but you can put something in front of God, you can put something in the place of God, that doesn't make it God, but it makes it a God in our life. And that's what the first commandment prohibits. Do not put anything in front of me in your life. Now the atheist might say, I don't believe in a God, so this doesn't apply to me. I don't think there's any God at all. But I like what G. Campbell Morgan points out. Every man needs a God. There is no man who is not somewhere in his heart, in his life, in the essentials of his being, a shrine in which a deity whom he worships. It is as impossible for a man to live without having an object of worship as it is for a bird to fly if it's taken out of the air. The very composition of human life, the mystery of man's being, demands a center of worship as a necessity of existence. All life is worship. There may be a false God at the center of life, but every activity of being, all the energy of life, the devotion of powers, these things are all worship. The question is not whether the life of, and powers of man are devoted to the worship of the true God or to that of a false one. In other words, the question is not will you worship, it's what God will you worship because you are worshiping something. I mentioned uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, the statement from that great theologian Bob Dylan. It might be the devil or it might be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. And he's right. We do. Every single one of us serves something or someone that becomes our God. Whatever is most important to you is your God. Whether you call it God or not doesn't matter. 
in fact, that's what it is. And it doesn't have to be a statue. We're going to look at not having any graven image or statues or idols, you know, what we tend to think of. Your God can be your career. Your God can be another person in your relationship to them. Your God can be your reputation. Your God can be your dream. Your God can be your children. Might be stepping on some toes there. Anything you put in front of God is your God. And God says there better not be anything else in front of me. God demands the priority of our lives. So it's not a question of whether we worship, it's what we worship. And really, this is not only the first commandment, this is the foremost commandment. Because if we don't get this right, none of the other ones matter. If God is not in his proper place in our lives, we've lost already. But God demands to be number one. You say, what right does he have to demand that? Oh, let me give you a few reasons. Number one, he made you. Number two, he saved you. (laughs) Number three, he's preparing a place for you so that when this life is over, you're going to spend eternity with him. How are you going to enjoy eternity in heaven if during these few years of life on earth we had no time for God? This is where it comes down to. God wants to be first in your life. Jesus summarized it this way in that classic statement he made on the Sermon on the Mount. Seek first God's kingdom. And all these other things will be yours as well. Now, don't take that to mean you're going to get wealthy and you know, healthy and all that stuff. What he says is, you put God first and everything else will fall into place. And it's amazing how that happens. Financially, when you give first to God, it is amazing how he provides for your needs. That doesn't mean you're going to be rich. It does mean he's going to provide your needs. When you give God first place in your time, It's amazing how he will enable you to get so much more done. When we give God first place in our homes, it's amazing how all those other relationships seem to fall in line. Doesn't mean they're going to be perfect because we're not perfect people. But when we put God first, the rest of life falls into place. Somehow, somewhere, someone must make it emphatic that God is not an add-on to our lives. He's not just one of many facets to our existence. When he permeates every aspect of our lives, our plans, our hopes, our dreams, our careers, we will soon discover that he's not some meddlesome person to have around, but a very indispensable and welcome presence. The first commandment leaves no doubts as to the position God wants in our lives. He demands first allegiance. God will not play second fiddle. He demands to be first. And when we give him first place, everything else will fall into place. I challenge you this morning. Who is God to you? Is God an add-on? Is God somewhere in the pack? Or is he first and foremost? Does he get the top consideration in how we spend our time? 
how we spend our money. How we decide the very significant issues and maybe even the insignificant issues. What place have we given God in our life? He demands to be first. He will not play second fiddle. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have not left us in the dark as to what you expect from us. But you have revealed your will. We thank you that you have graciously redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb. That you have saved us from sin by grace through faith. And because of that, we are your children. And now as your children, you are telling us how you want us to act. I pray that each one of us today would look deep inside our hearts and ask some very tough questions. Have we made you the first priority of our lives? Or do we use you as a last resort? When all else fails, I guess I'll ask God. Help us to live in the light of the first commandment so that nothing takes your place in our lives. May we always keep you number one. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.